Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about why this moment in time seemed like the right time to write all the single ladies? Well, in my case, it was a confluence of things that I knew as a journalist, because I'd been writing about the world from a feminist perspective as a reporter um, and a, an opinion columnist, um, but also just in terms of my reporting, I knew that the numbers of single women were rising. I knew that the marriage age was getting older. Um, you know, I had read the stuff about, you know, there are now more single women in New York than married women. and. I'd read that there were more single people in the United States than married people. And I knew that this was a seismic shift, um, just sort of having the basic journalistic and historical knowledge um, as a feminist journalist. So I knew that it was a story. And I also knew that it was a story that was in part about um, economic independence, that was about economic means, that was about race. I'd read all kinds of the scare literature aimed directly at African Americans, um, the Steve Harvey genre of sort of punishing messages sent especially toward Black women. I'd seen, um, I, I thought about the sort of rise of the um, say yes to the dress culture of wedding fetishization and the growth of the wedding industrial complex, which I understood as a journalist to be um, probably happening in reaction to a move away from marriage as the defining institution of adulthood for women. I understood all that as a journalist. I knew there was a great story there. It didn't occur to me to write a book about it, actually, um, until I was getting married. And the funny thing is, um, I had been single and written about my own life as a single person, as a journalist. In a couple, I, you know, here and there, I, I have written personal essays, so that's not the bulk of what I do. Um, I had written a story for Salon in, I believe, 2004 about my best friend and girlfriends as the new husbands and the way that female friendship um, and friend networks, social networks, were doing the work of the familial work of being the care networks for women who are living outside of marriage. I had been unmarried through my 20s, but unlike many of my girlfriends who were also unmarried, I didn't really know many married peers. One or two people I knew married after college. Um, but mostly everybody in my social network, my professional network, who is my age, was unmarried. But unlike many of them, I also was not romantically attached during my 20s. I didn't have, I had one on and off relationship for a couple of years um, that wasn't very stable or reliable. And, and when I was not in that, I really, I lived like a nun. I wasn't having, I didn't, I wish that I could have had a casual sex life. I did not. It was just not, I wasn't built for it. Um, you know, I didn't have dates to weddings. I didn't have, I didn't go on vacations with romantic partners. I, and, and I think that having not been in and out of relationships, having not had, um, having always been the single person at every event, had sort of, my identity was so tied to my singleness. It was such an unusual thing about me. There was, there had, you know, through my twenties and into my thirties, and I had never really been in love in any satisfying way. And I didn't know that I ever would be. I mean, there, you know, I think this haunts everybody, right? Um, who, who lives independently, and hasn't fallen in love or in a reciprocal or satisfying way, the thought that like, well, maybe we just won't. And of course, there are lots of people who who don't form those kinds of partnerships for a variety of reasons. Um, and then in my early 30s, I did fall in love very swiftly and very seriously. And then we decided to get married. And so I was getting married at 35, um, which was great. I was, I was very happy about it. But it was a big shift in identity for me. It was so strange to suddenly be the person who had um, the significant other after years of really being the, often the only person who didn't have a significant other, seemed permanently single. And then suddenly I had the boyfriend and I was gonna have the husband. And um, so I was, I was tracking the way that my friendships were changing because it was a huge shift. My friends had been my vacation partners, my family, the, the people that I made my decisions about, about my healthcare policies, my jobs, my asking for raises and promotions and you know bitching about my parents and all of it that, you know, all of it had been with my friends. And here I had this person that I was living with. We moved in together very soon after falling in love. And so there was a big identity shift for me. And then when we were getting married, the way that people treated me was so striking. Um, they acted like they were happier about this than they'd been about anything else in my life, including simply falling in love, which for me was the big shift. It was, it was meeting somebody who was a good romantic partner 
and who I fell for, that was much bigger than getting married. Like getting married was kind of a technicality and it was, we did it for a number of reasons that weren't about, you know, life changing things. It was just made sense for a number of reasons. Falling in love had been a big deal, but also building my career, making my home in the world, um, making New York City my own, um, finding my friends, forming a family of human beings, becoming an adult in the world, all of which I had done prior to falling in love. And yet I was being treated in many ways as if this was the signal achievement of my life at 35. And it was like, no, I'm 35 years old. I have a life, I'm a whole person. And my husband was 45, he's 10 years older than I am. And even the sort of, um, the rituals around marriage, the, the and, and this is not to, I, I don't want to make anybody feel bad, who, the people who do this and embrace this, and of course, ritual and, and celebration all has its part, and we did, we had a party, we had a big party, you know, it wasn't a traditional wedding, but it was a big party, we invited lots of people to come, I don't want to pretend like, oh, we eschewed all that, no, but, um, you know, the sort of like registering for plates, and it was like, we are too adult people we have we have too many plates we had big lives full of plates like this was we're grown-ups <laughs> this is not the beginning and it made me think in a more personal and lived way about this that all the sort of expectations around marriage were still treating it as the defining entrance into adulthood when for me, it had nothing to do with the beginning of my adulthood. It was something that was happening to me in the midst of my adulthood. It was something that was happening to me in part because I'd become my own person independently. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have met this person um, or formed this relationship had I been 22, you know? Um, and that's not to say that that's, I, I, you know, it's that's sort of a hard thing to say because I don't mean to say like that the singlehood just served the ability to get married. That's not what I'm talking about. I also might just as well have never met him and continued to live independently for the rest of my life or met somebody when I was 85. I mean, I don't know. But I don't think that my life what prior to this meeting or had this meeting not happened was inherently less valuable, less real, or less connected to the world. In fact, in many ways, it was more connected to the outside world than my life since I have partnered in a more traditional way. So I, that personal lived experience of these, these um, you know, contradictions and anachronistic behaviors around getting married made me think both of my life as it had been lived up to that point as a woman living independently in marriage and the reporting that I knew was out there and the interesting ways and and I think important ways that that the identity of the the unmarried woman is represented in pop culture and then as it's actually lived by women who do not have government policies to support life outside of marriage who do not have money means who do not have social or community support for living independently of marriage and I just wanted to write a, a sort of full account of what the new, the changed map of female adulthood and what it, what it means and what it feels like for women across classes, races, religions, geographic regions um, in the United States. And so that's, that's where the book came from. I did, one thing I really appreciated too is how it could, because you are married and have a child, you know, and like it could have, all the single ladies could have easily kind of been something I think if you weren't as talented as you are it could have been like and then I met my husband like that could have been the end of the book and and it's not and what was that like to be to navigate that well I think it's very fair I, you know I, I certainly have heard from um critics of the book who said like oh bully for her like she's it's easy for her to celebrate singlehood and you know that's fair like I don't know what to say to that it is fair um you know, I remember distinctly in my late 20s reading a magazine article by a woman that I know. I, at the time, I didn't know her very well. It's in a magazine where I, I myself have written, and, and she's a really talented writer. And she was writing about being newly married or newly engaged or something. I was very single at the time, um, as I always was. <laughs> and um, and the, she wrote about her single life in a way that made me throw the magazine across the the room because she was said something like oh and i've been single for so long i used to imagine like being found by you know because the smell drifted out into the hallway it was like the old harry and sally line or like being eaten alive by the cats or whatever it was some and it was like but now i'm a domestic goddess and i was so 
enraged. I known this woman as a single woman, you know, I had, and I just thought, oh my God, this is just, it's, it is, it's like telling the story as a journey toward the destination. I was very conscious of the fact that I was writing this as a smug married. Like I am hetero married. I live in Park Slope. I have two children, one of whom just came into this room. Like I am the, I am the worst nightmare of the single woman who doesn't. And I, you know, look, I just got a bad book review last week that suggested that the book was in service of saying, don't worry, it all turns out okay, I got married. I, you know, I, I get that criticism. And if I, I worked very hard to make that not be the takeaway, there wasn't a lot I could do about it. I was getting married and I did want to write this book. And I did think that the history of single women was crucial. And I thought that the, that the story about single women and the relationship between unmarried life for women in the United States and social policy and social progress is so crucial and such an important part of our progressive politics and where we need to go forward um, that I couldn't not write the book. But I, but I also think that um, it's fair enough to be irritated by my position as a married writer writing about unmarried life. There's nothing I can do about that. It's, you know, and except to hear that criticism and say, yeah, I get it. I made it the same way. I made an effort not to. Look, one of the things I made an effort to say in the book, and I do hope it comes across because it's really important, is that while not wanting to be dishonest about the the happiness that my particular relationship brings me, and it brings me tremendous happiness, and I feel, um, you know, extremely lucky um, to be in a good relationship, one of the things that we are never honest about um, is the are, are the variety of ways to be unhappy within marriage, right? Well, first of all, that even a good relationship that, that makes you happy, as I am in, um, involves tremendous sacrifice of independence, and that that is a real loss. It's not like, oh, a fake loss, oh, I miss dancing on the tables or whatever. No, it, it, it involves loss of um, depth of friendship with people. It can, it can, it, it can involve a withdrawal from the world. I, I miss my, my independence, um, in certain ways. Um, it involves, you know, sort of sacrifice and, and putting your needs, you know, alongside the needs of others in ways. And, and that's not that single people don't do that too. In fact, single people are much more likely to take on the responsibilities of family care, of parental care, um, of doing a lot of the work, a lot of the work of, of society, of, go, of being involved in politics and helping in, in community uh, outreach stuff. And so it's not as simple as you get married and, and marriage depends a lot on the quality and the timing and the circumstances. And one of the things that I thought to make clear in this book is that married life does not equal inherently happier or less lonely life for women. We have this thing because married life remains a sort of imaginative norm, even though it's not necessarily a lived norm anymore, where, so you think of a human being, a woman, and imagine that she is lonely, right? And that she thinks she always thought she'd have a different kind of life, that she always thought she'd have, um, you know, a different set of satisfactions than what she has. She is unsatisfied with what she has. She feels lonely and cut off from the world, right? And she feels like she would have connections that she lacks. Now, that woman, if you imagine her single, it's totally, you fill in all the blanks. Oh yeah, she thought she would be married. She thought she would have kids. She had a vision of herself as a kind of person who had a happy family that she doesn't have. She's missed that. Train and, and society fills in that narrative so that if in fact you are in that situation and there are plenty of women who are plenty of women who are deeply saddened by the fact that they haven't found a traditional romantic connection that they don't perhaps if they don't have traditionally configured families if they don't you know if they don't have a partnership they don't live with somebody all kinds of things that women are truly sad about truly wish in some cases that they'd chosen differently at different points in their lives all that is real that's not made up right and you want to be able to acknowledge that. And that, but at the same time, you take that same vision of that same woman. And the fact is she can just as easily be a married woman. And in fact, often is, we know this from like 
our friends, our families, right? Married women can feel tremendous regret about the life that they did not lead. They can feel totally estranged from the person that they are married to. That is a very common experience of marriage, of especially marriages begun early in life. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't want to say specifically youthful marriages turn out poorly. That's not necessarily the case. But we know that this is also a familiar story of the married woman who has all these regrets about a life she didn't lead, a degree of independence, um, perhaps professional or social uh, bonds and investments that she doesn't have, that as a young child she thought she'd have, and yet she's now married, she doesn't feel a connection, she feels misunderstood, she doesn't feel known, right? We all know that can be just as true. But we don't send the message that that state of loneliness is symptomatic of marriage, right? The same way that we say, oh, it's symptomatic of singlehood. Both states can exist in both, but that, that loneliness, unhappiness, dissatisfaction is, is not actually tied to whether or not you're married. The form it takes is tied to your circumstances, but the human condition of loneliness or unhappiness is not tied to, to your marital status. And there's been lots of research on loneliness that, that says exactly that. It's not about whether or not you're married. However, our narratives are so in place to diagnose it as being related, if you were a single person, to your singleness. It's, we never view it as symptomatic of marriage. Right. You know, and yeah. so that's one of this, you know, what the, some of those associations are the ones that I would like to challenge and to complicate and say, actually, you know, yes, unhappiness and loneliness is a reality for lots of women who are unmarried and unattached in a traditional romantic configuration. But, but unhappiness and dissatisfaction and loneliness are also the condition of many married women who are married in like, you, you name it, fairy tale wedding to like handsome person, you know, hetero wonderland, you know, at 23, <laughs> um, honeymoon in Mallorca, and they might be just as unhappy you know, even though they've had this honeymoon end of a Disney movie send off, they might be just as happy. And in fact, often are five years or 10 years after that marriage as somebody who never had that wedding to begin with. And society just tells her in part that it's the absence of the wedding that's led her to that condition of unhappiness. Which I think one of my, I mean, I just, I loved so much about the book, but um, I really, really appreciated how you traced the social and economic limitations put on women, right? That like part of why you can have a happy marriage now and you can be fulfilled is because it's not your only option. I think is it um, when you're talking about like the revolution in the '60s, like like revolution is is options, right? Is different opportunities for women. Right. It's not that, so that what happens when you have the social movements and this includes um, certainly the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, um, the sexual revolution, the legalization of uh, birth control and abortion that permit women to have uh, reproductive autonomy, which is so key to their being able to live independently from men. Um, what you have is not just one alternate path. The, the trouble with the marriage model, which was reliant on women being economically, socially, and sexually dependent on men, right? The government society enabled men to be earners, to be the people who made the money, right? And women didn't have those same options for a long time. And thus, you had a class of people, women, who were dependent on men if they wanted economic security. In turn, those men were dependent on the unpaid labor of wives to raise their children, take care of their houses, so that that, that enabled them to be in the public sphere and go and do the work of wage earning, right? That was just, marriage was an institution that organized power according to gender in this country for a long time. Now, what happened when you, and, and what that meant is that you took all these millions of women and, you know, and put them all sort of on a similar path. You, you kind of had to establish a connection to the kind of person who could keep you economically stable. If you wanted a sex life that was socially sanctioned, if you wanted to have a family, all that had to be done under the umbrella of this institution. Um, and, and if it were, wasn't, you were often found yourself in social slash economic peril as a, you know, as an outcast, or if you're very lucky, a sort of rebel, but that required funds. Okay. That required money. You got to be the rebel. Right. So, um, basically what the, what the 
social revolutions in the 19th and the 20th century, you know, um, wound up doing. And again, starting with abolition and suffrage, moving into the labor movement, the settlement house movement, and then the 20th century social movements um, was enable women to have more choices. So it put women in the workforce. It, it um, expanded opportunities for more people to go on to get secondary educations, to go into different kinds of careers. Um, it did result in the legalization of reproductive autonomy, um, access to abortion, the ability to decide when, if, and under what, what circumstances to have children, um, but <coughs> a sexual revolution that changed norms that enabled you to have an extra, a, 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 a premarital or extramarital sex life. Um, all that stuff combined um, to give women things they could do with their life besides get married. Um, and in some cases, those things take up our, the whole life, you know, in some cases. So marriage can, it can be a part of a life that also may include um, working for wages, having children on your own, um, you know, finding economic independence on your own, having an autonomous sex life, um, you know, uh, and we also have expanded the ways in which we can conceive of marriage to now include same sex partnership. Um, you know, of course, it's it's very common. Lots of unmarried women have live-in partners. Um, that's increasingly... Basically, we've changed the configurations of family and the sort of notions of what constitute an adult female life. Of course, a lot of this stuff is really dependent on policy. And this is one of the things in a new administration that is really determined not just to roll back the advances of the Obama administration, for example, when it comes to the ACA coverage, but to really roll back advances. I mean, there's no question that Roe is imperiled. And not only that, that the Republican Party is very interested in rolling back access to contraception itself, you know, um, which is legalized first for married couples and then for single people, um, you know, 50 years ago. But 40 and change years ago. Um, but if you actually took away women's ability to control their re reproduction, if you fail to enforce, for example, things like sexual harassment protections um, that enable women to be in the workforce without fear of harassment that sort of affects them as a class of worker, um, what you get are conditions that do not um, make it easy for women to live independent lives. And that's something that's really at stake in. in at this point, you know, throughout my book tour, which was largely before the election, I, I published this book last year, lots of people said, are we going to go backwards? Are we going to see a decrease in the marriage age? Are we going to see people marrying? And my answer was that, sure, there'll probably be variances like that because we do live in, in you know, we make big leaps forward and then there's small backlashes and, you know, there'll be sort of trend lines that probably move backward and forward, but that really, um, barring a massive change in social policy and economic policy, I didn't think we were going to completely go back to an era in which most women married between the ages of 20 and 22. I think that is with, given the scope of what this new administration wants to do. Um, I think that we are looking at a point of real peril for women's ability to live independently because they do want to go much further in terms of the rollbacks of, um, of rights and protections that enable women's independence from marriage. And I was wondering, how do you see that emergence of politically engaged, active um, young women, how do you see that relating to this presidency? Well, I think that it's, you know, unmarried women have been a tremendous political force, especially as their numbers have grown. And something that I predicted that I was both right and wrong about, about this election was that that unmarried women could be the deciding factor. Um, they are the the segment of the electorate most likely to vote left. And in fact, once again, they voted by a much higher margin than just women. Um, they voted for the 23% of the electorate and they voted for Hillary Clinton 63 to 32% over Donald Trump. Um, there is one area in which uh, I was wrong and, or, and it's interesting, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of how I was wrong. White single women, so white women always vote Republican. They have always voted Republican, white women. Um, and I think that, but white single women are the segment of white women who vote Democratic or have in the past two elections. They voted for Barack Obama over Mitt Romney and over John McCain. White single women voted for Donald Trump. But, and, and there's some, so it's possible, as some people have argued, that this is a class, that this is a question of, um, of income inequality and that 
a lot of the white single women who we're talking about were, you know, working class white voters in the Midwest. I'm not sure. I, I, it could be that's possible. I'm unsure about that diagnosis. It could be women voting with an eye to their racial privilege. It could be, you know, which is, you know, the, the thing is that Clinton's proposals, which were actually very, very progressive um, when it came to issues specifically affecting women, unmarried women, um, sort of new contemporary family configurations and, uh, and people of color, the, the, these were, she was talking about paid leave. She was talking about subsidized daycare, raise, raising the minimum wage, raising the wages specifically of caregivers, um, fields dominated by women and often single women, um, minimum wage workers, two thirds are, are women. So um, it seems unlikely, that's the most progressive economic platform that any president has run on really in our lifetimes. Um, and it seems progressive, especially with an eye to, to single women. So I, I haven't been totally persuaded by the idea that it was just like single white women who really cared about uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I, like, I'm not totally sold on that. Um, I do think there is a possibility, obviously white women voted with an eye toward their racial, pre pre uh, racial privilege. This is um, you know, a larger trend that we saw this year. Uh, partly a backlash against Barack Obama and his administration, partially a backlash against a campaign that was not really aimed at, um, at white men and white women vote with my, white men. There's one other possibility. I did notice when I looked at those numbers. So in 2012, um, it, the numbers were 67% for Obama to 31% for Romney. And in 2016, it was 63% for Clinton versus 32% for Trump. So it's not like the, and they were the same percentage of the electorate. So it's not as though women, unmarried women moved over to Trump. He gained by only one percentage point and she lost from Obama by four percentage points. So one of the possibilities is that those white women were young white women voting for Jill Stein because there is a category of third party that takes 5% of unmarried women of all races. And I don't, I don't think Jill Stein was pulling a lot of the votes of single women of color. So it could be in part the number of young white women who are voting third party. We like to tell ourselves that we're further along than we are. We like to tell ourselves a story about how because we elected Barack Obama president, it meant that we were in a better place when it comes to race in this country than we are. You know, we like to tell ourselves that we're a lot further along than we are when it comes to gender too. So one of the most popular storylines in 2016 was that of course Hillary Clinton was gonna win. She was part of the establishment. She was the, she herself represented the power. And there wasn't enough attention played, paid to the fact that she was an outsider by every historical measure that there has, we have literally never, never nominated, major party in this country had never in over 200 years nominated a woman for the presidency, um, let alone elected one, and we still haven't. We've never had a woman vice president. I mean, this is, and this is over 50% of the population that has gone wholly unrepresented in the executive branch. So we, the fact that we managed to tell ourselves that, and lots of people, lots of the people who are voting third party or who didn't vote, did so because they were telling themselves, oh yeah, she's, she's the establishment. She's, got it rigged. She's going to be president. Of course, she's going to win. And and that's symptomatic of us telling ourselves we're further along than we are. We're not, you know? And so I think this was a real wake up call. I know a lot of women who, you know, were ambivalent or weren't sure or regarded her as a sure thing, even if, you know, liked her or not liked her and, and who just had a like cold water poured on them. So this is a reminder and it's and it's a reality it's i don't actually yes of course it's a move backward when it comes to to policy and the real perils that we face now but i don't think this is a new form of sexism this is what was at stake all the time we just told ourselves that that we were beyond it when we weren't i really appreciated how how you brought so much awareness into race about race and class into all the single women that all the single ladies that you know black women were actively barred from suburban domesticity and that in a lot of ways they were the ones who had to work to support this idea of the married utopia right um how did you keep that focus broad um especially as just like a, a white sing a white formerly single woman like how did how did you make sure that those stories were told well i think that it was in part you just have to really remember that 
the definition of America is not how um, I, as a white kid in a predominantly white suburb was taught it. I was taught America as white. And it has been a process of, there's something, there's an old quote that was actually, um, I guess it's Gloria Steinem, and I'm not like a quote aphorism kind of person, but I think it was Gloria who says, our job is not to learn, it's to unlearn. And um, and I, I, I do think that there's, I don't, you know, I'm sort of aware of how I answer this question in part because, um, in part because I think that there's also a tendency like for white feminists to consider race to like give themselves cookies and like pat themselves on the back for like just being super woke or whatever. And I, I wanna stress that in part my my learning curve on reconsidering what I n know and knew of American history has been really um, intense. I mean, I've I have screwed up, I can tell you, ways that I have written about race in recent years that like were just wrong. And, um, and that's also not to be like performatively self-flagellating. It's like, it's about being open to it. Well, being curious and thinking, wait a minute, there's probably another part of this story that I never, um, I never was taught. I mean, I actually, I, I had this horrible, I've been trying to figure this out for the past uh, few days because I saw friends of mine on Twitter saying, Oh, you know, I, so here's a reminder that some Americans were taught that Eli Whitney was black. And I was like, oh my God, I think I might've been taught that Eli Whitney was black. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it. So America, I, I, the, the way we, that we initially encounter um, many of the histories that are made central and most available um, to young people um, is a very different version of America from you know the one that, that is available with a little more searching. And so um, it was really about um, <clears throat> understanding that, going in with an initial understanding that the Sex and the City version of single womanhood was deeply incomplete. It was incomplete for white women to begin with, right? The sort of consumerist fantasy and the and the um, the capitalist. Uh, version of what independence meant, like very expensive shoes. And it's, you know, um, but then beyond that, <laughs> the whiteness of it and acknowledging that like the predecessor to Friends was Living Single, you know, um, which was a show about black single people, just basic sort of pop culture understanding that it wasn't Friends that was the breakthrough. Friends was a right, white appro appropriation of a show that had existed the year before. Um, as a, as a show about black characters and that never became the like Thursday night blockbuster on NBC. Um, it's about thinking about um, Bridget Jones's diary as being as being credited with kicking off this whole genre called Chicklet and understanding that Terry McMillan had been writing about black characters for years that preceded that um, black characters living singly. It's about um, and then and and then you just think about how appropriation and culture and actually a lot of what we understand to be revolutionary social progress, um, and this is this is about looking at the history of social movements and understanding that a lot of the things that, for example, I've already talked about it in this interview, the sort of revolution of women entering the workforce. When I say that, I'm actually talking about white women. That's the, I mean, predominantly white middle class women in the 1970s. That's that, and it was revolutionary, right? You don't want to take away from the fact that that was, that had political and economic impact. And it wasn't just on white women, but it was, but, but the fact is that low income women, poor women, and predominantly women of color have always worked. It has never been an option to not work. Um, and that often gets erased as it did even me talking about it here, you know, within this past half hour, um, because the white women's stories still predominate. And that's one of the things that we're seeing right now that I think is very interesting um, in terms of the activism is the women of color um, are the activist leaders. And, and I think that's really crucial to the next step we have to take forward because in fact, women of color have led on this stuff for a long time. So whether it's being in the workforce, and it's not just, it's not just the sort of fact that, that 
Economically disadvantaged women and often women of color were always in the workforce by necessity. You had people like the lawyer Sadie Alexander, who is an African American lawyer, writing in the 1930s, um, you know, predating Betty Friedan by by 20 or 30 years, making arguments for why women's earning was crucial not only to the economy but to their own to their marriages. She's also like Friedan, writing with an assumption that that women are married, um, you know, to the power dynamics and emotional dynamics within marriage. Um, Sadie Alexander, sort of Betty Friedan, she doesn't get the credit. Um, women living singly. So as you as you said, this is one of the the things that I tried to tease out. You know, at the founding, um, African American women are enslaved, and and marriage law is patrolled really fiercely. Marriages aren't recognized legally, but on the other hand, in some places and situations, marriage is forced on enslaved people. Um, and so the freedom to even marry isn't available to African Americans when we're talking about the founding. And yet, <coughs> unmarried women in the colonies, um, you know, you were considered a spinster, um, anything up to age 26, then you get considered a thornback, which is an unpleasant name for like a seascape. It was really unmarried women were very, very rare in, in early America, unmarried white women. Then after emancipation, uh, black women for a series of economic reasons and because it is now legally recognized, marriage rates go up for, for African Americans. And it's in this period that actually a lot of, after the Civil War, when a lot of white men are going west as part of exploration, of westward exploration, um, that East Coast women find themselves without a lot of husbands to choose from because there aren't that many men. The East Coast sort of empties of men. And you have a generation of middle class, predominantly white women, who wind up living unmarried lives in the late 19th century. And they're, I mean, in advance of emancipation, they throw a lot of their energies suddenly unencumbered by the duties of wifeliness and, and motherhood. They throw a lot of their energies into social movements around them, often religiously uh, motivated movements, including abolition, then suffrage, the labor movement, the settlement house movement. And you see unmarried women in the in the ranks of leadership of all these social movements that that wind up like that wind up deeply changing the economic and social circumstances of women and people of color in the United States. Then there's this pushback in the mid 20th century that's always been read as, oh, after the war, after the depression, and after women had gone into the workforce as Rosies during the during the war, white women, and oh, in fact, a lot of the models for Rosie the Riveter were, were women of color. Um, oh, then they get pushed back into the home. But it was it was a little bit more than that too. And this is something that Ferdinand was writing about when she wrote um, The Feminine Mystique. It was also pushing these women who'd been living singly at the beginning of the 20th century back into marriage. A lot of things conspired at the same time. The medical uh, profession started to treat singlehood as a perversion. Lesbianism, close ties between women as a perversion. Those things were new at the beginning, in the sort of beginning to mid of the 20, mid 20th century. And you see white women in the po in post-war America pushed into this middle class sort of sarcophagus, suburbs literally built, you know, with government loans, excluding black families, um, highways built to deliver the, the white men to those suburbs where they were supposed to have, you know, wives and children waiting in their perfectly manicured homes for their lawns. But a lot of the very, and the government's behind this structuring of the middle class, right? This is what we think of as when the government really did get behind, like creating a middle class in, in the United States, creating a strong manufacturing atmosphere, building the infrastructure that gets the goods from where they're produced to where they're going to be sold, builds, invests in the, in the GI Bill. But what we don't, and, and that culture of creating the middle class in part was built on reestablishing white women as wives, early married wives. And that's the highest, that, that was when more American women were married well, while they kept, in the years they've kept track of it. That was the height of early married culture for the United, in the United States for women. And women were dropping out of colleges that they don't, at the beginning of the 20th century, they'd suddenly won their way into being able to enter. They were dropping out to get married after their freshman, sophomore years. Um, you know, girls who didn't have engagement rings but in graduation, by graduation in like 1960 were given lemons at graduation instead of flowers. Um, super early marriage culture imposed on white women. But at the same time, all those 
government backed systems that helped to build that white middle class were cutting off black families. Those black families were not permitted in a lot of, in the Levitt towns, in the, in the suburban developments that the government was underwriting and helping white families establish themselves in. The highways that were built to get those guys from their city jobs to the suburbs were cutting off black families, black neighborhoods from public transportation, from job centers, creating kind of ghettoized, um, communities of color within cities. And, and there wasn't the money, the jobs, the government support. Black families couldn't take advantage of the GI Bill in the same way because black co colleges weren't admitting black students. Um, <coughs> the Veterans Administration was really sort of screwing over a lot of black servicemen. And what you got was a loss of economic stability in a black community that made marriage a less tenable option. You didn't have incomes and educations to, um, you know, to, to, to make those split levels with the manicure lawns. You couldn't buy the houses. Black neighborhoods were being redlined. Mortgages were, were um, at usurious rates for, for black families. And so you saw the marriage rate for black families begin to drop. And so the result, and it, this is, it's cutting black and white women off from each other because the white woman's experience is being pushed into this sort of suffocating domestic early married role. And white women are being cut off from all the economic resources that would permit them to even have that role as an option. Um, and so at, what you see is the publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, which is that white feminist explosion out of those suffocating suburbs. And then two years later, you get the Moynihan Report, which diagnoses black poverty as sort of centered around unmarried black women, the, the matriarchal household. And, um, you know, it's as if those two experiences, those they, they are at odds, but they're both different ways of sort of containing and controlling your, your population, your non-white male population. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the patterns that the book explores. But then you have black women who are unmarried at higher rates, starting in sort of the 50s, moving through the 60s. They are vilified um, up, you know, through the 80s as welfare queens. And, um, you know, the image of the black single mother is, is portrayed as kind of monstrous and dangerous to society. And then when white women begin to imitate the same behavior, not marrying at the beginning, which you know begins to happen in the 70s, not really, but really starts to explode in the 90s, then it gets celebrated so that you have something like Sex in the City, which treats unmarried womanhood as a revolution, a social revolution, and again, as it is. But that's a revolution that originated um, in response to economic necessity in a black community. And yet the the, the women of color who lived that way were treated as aberrations and as dangers and, and as villains and as the destroyers of, you know, the American family. And white women who are also viewed as challenging and problematic when they don't marry were also celebrated as like, you know, people who have very revolutionary brunches or whatever. You know? <laughs> um, okay. I just think it's very important that we look so much of what we understand to be revolution um, when it comes to white women, um, you know, originates with, with black women. In terms of bringing these two groups that if they were really united and like really not just united, but if we were, if as a group, they were able to speak with each other and like kind of galvanize women as a movement without it being, um, you know, like white women, like Patty, like like without it being like the help, do you know? But what kind of what do you think that would look like? What kind of change do you think would be? Um, well, I think you could see it. You could see it in the women's march. I mean, it really matters that the women's march was not, you know. And it, look, there were problems with it. It was by many measures predominantly white women who marched. Um, it's interesting. It's only been two weeks. I, you know, my hope is I, you saw those signs that said, you know, I hope these nice white ladies, you know, come and march for black lives. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know whether that's going to happen, but it needs to. What needs to happen is that white women need to look beyond their own circumstances. So it's always the women's movement has always been a fraught and challenging movement because it's a majority movement. It's not about, so it has to represent the perspectives, aims, and, and um, aspirations and inequities faced by over half of our population. And of course, when you're talking about a number that's that large, you're also talking about women of such varied experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives, and identities that... <clears throat> 
you know, there's, it's always going to be cacophonous. It's always going to be at odds internally, right? So that's not, it's not like it's new that there are divisions between experience. I think that the thing that has to happen moving forward is that white women need to take a little bit of a backseat. And, and it's, you know, look, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, I think that the Women's March was a great example because um, it was women of color as leaders, as speakers, as performers. There were white women who were there. The, the march itself was probably um, too white <laughs> in terms of the marchers, but it wasn't, it wasn't Lily White. And the, you know, it was all over the world. It was so, there were so many of them. Um, but also it was lining up behind a platform that put the issues and inequities faced by women of color front and center. So it wasn't just like issues that affect white women directly. It was saying, look, if you're talking about a women's movement, what we're also talking about is criminal justice reform. We're talking about, um, you know, indigenous women. We are talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about climate justice. Um, and that those are all women's issues and white ladies, like it's time for you to understand how those are women's issues. And I have been heartened so far. And I just don't know if like, this is my optimism. I mean, I've been to a lot of protests in the past two weeks and I have seen a lot of white ladies at protests that I'm not sure they would have been at, um, before the women's March before Donald Trump. So I, you know, I'm hopeful. But this has been, there's a long history. Um, it is, it is a very difficult project to, the women's movement is rooted in, and this is, this is a heteronormative thing to say, but, but it's, it's true. One of the fundamental challenges of the women's movement is that it asks women to challenge the people who they literally sleep with as their oppressors, to identify as their oppressors, their lovers, their, their husbands if they're married, their brothers, their fathers, their friends, their sons, and to say, look, you, you know, I am in some ways standing up against you who I personally love, you know, and saying, and that is, that is a very, very tricky persuasive project. And and especially when you bring racial power into it. And, you know, it is very hard. Women enjoy power that historically has been proximal through men and white women have enjoyed a larger share of it because white men have had the power. And so white women have had their own racial privilege and the power that is afforded to them by men and trying to convince them um, that to think differently about power and gender and their own position and to think about other people has been a project that has been underway for a long time. I am hopeful that we can move it forward now that this has brought us to a kind of crisis point. Um, I wish it hadn't, I wish it hadn't, um, where, where white women are forced to think outside of their own experience and their own privilege. I can't believe how much, you know, I, just the number of times I use the word privilege now, which is not a word that I used to love. I think, it, you know, it, it sometimes has sounded jargony and, and um, off-putting, but it, there's very little other way to describe what I'm talking about. Um, so I don't know. I think it really does mean acknowledging um, women of color, not just as like partners, or, but as the leaders, as the forward thinkers, as the people who've been there first and who've been doing this the longest and, and, and who have burdens that are greater um, than, than those born by many white women um, and saying, okay, show us what we do. Tell us, tell us, 